Okay, so this is gonna be this is gonna have to be very very fast. So it's gonna be fun. So um, for some people, this may seem like a little bit repetitive because I did something very similar in the GNU Tools Control Conference uh, to get you know like the the the, the GNU Tools and people and maintainers, the other maintainers of GCC, like on board with all this. So anyway, so John Hong. He expressed it very well. In theory, this whole problem is not solvable, but in practice, it works. So the thing is, we, from the tool chain, from the tools perspective, we need to make compiled BPF uh, practical, and uh, we need to make it, you know, like uh, as easy as possible for people to actually write uh, BPF programs in high-level languages like C, and actually to compile those high level programs into low level BPF, like BPF assembly. And we should make the experience as normal as possible. Like when you write C programs for other architectures to the extent that it is possible. So in GCC in particular, um, the, the BPF support in, the, in GCC and the GNU tool chain, we've been working for a few years in it. And the first goal, which is the number one there, was to sort of achieve a parity, you know, in terms of functionality with Clang, because Clang was like the native, the first uh, compiler support, optimizing compiler support in B, uh, BPF target. And then that involves to compile all the BPF uh, kernel, the kernel BPF self-tests. We are there at the moment. We managed finally. There are one or two here which are giving us some problems, but because they rely on some particular LVM optimizations, but that's something that can be can be fixed. Um, and then the next step is to actually run the BPF self-tests. And basically we have two goals. First is to compile and run all actually existing BPF programs. And this is important because again, mm, we I mean to 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 compile and run all potentially existing BPF program, I don't, you know, it's going to be complicated, but at least the ones which are actually existing and used and developed, then we should support them. Um, okay. So I'm not going to repeat what Jung Hong said already. There are several verifiers. This is, you know, like the development cycle. You write your BPF program in C, you compile it to BPF assembly code, you get an object, you put it in the kernel, you load it in, it gets verified, it gets executed, or it gets rejected and you get, you know, like some error, some error messages. So, um, toolchain wise, so compiler wise, basically the challenges that at least on the GNU side, on GCC we are facing is basically, the first one is that BPF as an architecture is peculiar. It's, it's peculiar, it's very peculiar. Um, and that imposes some problems, but those are not interested here. The second one are the big ones, which is that you need to be able to, from an optimizing compiler, you need to be able to generate code that can be verified by some existing verifier, like the kernel verifier. That's the big deal here. And the last one is also important, which is um, we need to be able to, 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 that this process, this whole process is not, it doesn't, for it to not drive people nuts, basically. So you have a C program, you compile it to BPF, you get, you try to verify it, you get an error from the verifier, but as Ching pointed out already, uh, the verifier, what it sees is the BPF code at the assembly level, and there is a gap because you are writing your program in C. Uh, so it's not that trivial or immediate to actually go up the gap, right? So, okay, what does this mean? So, so those assembly instructions, what source level construct referred to. So um, as far as we can we see it, I mean, there are two uh, sources of unverifiability, right? The first one is some source constructs in C, for example, are inherently not verifiable. Like for example, a jump table, an, an indirect jump, right? I mean, an indirect jump, how can you actually verify or how can you um, uh, predict where the jump is going? So it's, um, when the compiler finds something like that, ideally, it should error out. If what if you tell the compiler that you want to generate some, you want to generate a verifiable code. 
at compile time. The second one is that even though in your C program, because you are a BPF program, right? So you are writing C program, a C program that you know you are going to compile to BPF, so you are careful to not have computed goals in it, for example, right? But still, um, from a completely legal C program, which in at face value is totally and completely verifiable, an optimizing compiler can very well actually do some transformation that leads to code that is not verifiable. And then your program will not actually pass the verifier. So those are the two main right, um, sources of not verifiability involved here. So then uh, what I, we did in Caldron was to discuss with the other GCC hackers and maintainers several approaches on how to tackle this. The first one is the approach zero, which is do nothing, ignore the problem. So uh, that is what GCC implements now, the BPF port in GCC. And um, well, I mean, uh, we generate BPF code in the backend. Mm, it sort of works for many use cases. For example, for the D-trace uh, runtime uh, support routines, it works, even though they had to actually overcome some stuff from the C part. It works maybe well enough. Um, but it's not, we know it's not good, it's not enough, because most of the kernel BPF self-tests uh, will not work with this. We need something else. The other approach is something that it was also mentioned here, which is, okay, if the optimizing compiler, this is for the second, uh, the second sort of problems here, which is the compiler generating not verifiable code from verifiable logic in your industry program, is disable everything, disable of the optimizations. Well, um, this has problems. This is not going to work in practice. First, it has an impact on performance on the program size, which actually is limited, maybe not as limited as it used to be, but it is still limited. Um, I think that verifier itself, it has a limit on the number of instructions that it can verify, right, as well. So the verifier itself is bounded. And um, and also, even if this worked, it was only it will be only a solution for the second kind of source of um, not verifiability that we saw. Because um, um, the source constructs that are not verifiable by itself intrinsically, they will remain there. And um, and actually, actually existing BPF programs, they require to be optimized. This is not correct, the minus O2, it should treat minus O1, but I think that it's recommended, uh, you recommend for it to use minus O2 anyway, in practice. So this will be the first approach, no optimizations. The second approach will be disable only the optimizations that we know lead to not verifiable code. Um, Okay, there are two issues here. First, and John Hong already mentioned, um, what leads to unverifiable code is not actually whole optimization passes, but only certain transformations that certain optimization passes produce, right? And also, in my opinion, um, this should be automatic to actually be practical for a day-to-day -day, uh, operation. Be why? Because people, tend to think about compilers, optimizing compilers, like modern ones, big ones, like, okay, you have a linear set of optimizations that happen, of passes that happen one after another. That's not the case. I mean, it's a mess. If you open in GCC the definition file that describes the, the different passes, I mean, there are hundreds of them, it's, it's not as simple as that, right? So. Basically, even if you could specify manually what particular optimizations you want to disable or inhibit, um, I, I would personally don't know how to do it. Right? And also, one optimization can have an effect on the next one. So it's not just I disable this optimization to avoid this transformation, and it will not happen because this may have an, ev an effect on some of past that happens afterwards. And actually removing that, that you know it, it leads to not verifiable code, could actually make another pass to actually generate a not verifiable code, right? So, and the granularity is bad. Actually, the last question is that can GCC actually try a pass? Well, that is the, 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 
how to make it automatic. We will need to get the verifier, extract some rules from it, like the set of constraints that it checks for, one particular version of the verifier, and, uh, and then somehow express it in the corresponding compiler internal representation contract, how to say. This is I call it IR legalization in, in LVM, I think. I don't know. In GCC, it will be like in RTL, like every time an optimization runs, you get the output of the optimization, and then you check those constraints and... Oh, yeah, verification. Yeah, yeah. Ver yeah. Okay. Fast, fast. The next, the other approach could be like what I call counterpasses or antipasses, which is that, okay, um, we know that this optimization pass is doing some certain transformation that it's making, it's, it's producing, it's ending, uh, producing not verifiable code. So I will intercalate an additional pass after that one to undo some of the transformations of the previous pass. And um, this is something that the Clank, uh, the LLVM BPF ta uh, target is, it does at the moment. Um, it works, it works. Um, um, but, uh, well, it has better granularity because you don't need to undo the whole pass. You only, you just need to undo the, whatever particular transformation was hurting you. Um, another huge advantage it has is that it's pretty neutral. You don't have to, to uh, even to talk with the, I don't know, middle end maintainers, you know, of, or the maintainers, you know, of the of other optimization passes. You can do it all the, all of it in your backend. So it's very, it's a very peaceful approach, right? So to say, um, the problem is it does, it is fragile. It is fragile because if some optimization pass changes, doing something completely, totally legal from a C semantics point of view or semantics point of view, it can break because you have to modify your counterpass to adapt to that change. Um, and another approach is instead of trying to undo previous transformations, you can try to actually somehow uh, hook from the target so from the target for the particular target for the BPF backend or whatever compiler to hook into the existing generic optimization passes. Um, this has also been used by Clang, which is what John Hong mentioned, right? Those, uh, in, it's called TTI, TTI uh, hooks. But um, the problem with this is that now you are stepping over the feet of the other maintainers. And this can be polemic because traditionally in optimizing compilers, we are in the we are with the concept of what is a, a legal transformation. A legal transformation is that you don't break semantics of what you are optimizing. But as someone in Calder, I think it was Florian, I think it was he mentioned, okay, well, this is like adding like an additional dimension to the whole compilation process because you have the dimension of um, program correctness from this a semantic point of view, but now we are adding another dimension, which is like predictability or verifiability, right? And I can I understand, and actually with the other GCC maintainers, I I could prove. I mean, I, it's true. Um, sometimes it's difficult to explain to some maintainer compiler maintainer that, look, your pass is legally correct, it's legally sound from a semantic point of view, but they want to hook into it to change something because I want the result to be predictable or verifiable. So this is not that, I mean, this can be like, this requires talking, basically. Um, and then there could be another approach, which will be generic pass tailoring. So it, this is not about the BPF backend hooking into generic passes to make them do, you know, like what we want them to do. No, this is like having um, a new option called minus O predictable or verifiable or whatever, that it will work in the same spirit, in the same way that minus O is small or minus O fast. What are those things? Those are hints for the compiler. So when you use minus O2, minus O3, or minus F, whatever, you are spe specifically saying, I want those optimizations to be activated or not. When you use minus O 
small or minus so fast, you are not specifying any particular fixed set of optimizations, but you are saying to the compiler, when you are processing and transforming the program and optimizing, if, if you have to choose between speed and size, give more weight to either speed or to size. And then you are, in the, well, indirectly, in a generic way, you are impacting the way that the compiler is doing the transformations, right? Okay. So the idea is to add a new one, which is verifiable, which is telling the, the compiler, which is the same, is telling the different optimization passes, which are generic, is if at some point you have to, you have in the balance performance, well, actually it will be like a tree balance, right? So you have performance, you have size and verifiability. So give more weight to verifiability. One example that we were talking, I was talking with John Hong before today. Um, if you pass to the compiler minus so verifiable, and the compiler is generating code for a switch statement, for example, the compiler will not generate a computed code or a jump table because it, it will know that that's not verifiable. So instead of that, it will generate a less efficient and a less compact, uh, probably sequence of jumps, right? Of conditional jumps but not, no longer indirect jumps that cannot be predicted at all. So that's, you know, this is. And um, the language level support, actually when I did this in, in Caldron, I was totally wrong because I was like, okay, let's make put annotations in the source code that the verifier can use conveying to it. But actually John pointed out, no, no, that's not gonna work. So basically this could be like, you must know pragmas and optimize or, or optimize or fail pragmas. The first one would be something like this. It's like pragma loop must bound to this particular bound. And what you are telling what you are telling the compiler is if you cannot infer by yourself at this particular point that this loop is bounded like that, error, compile time error. Um, how will this work? Well, this will not guarantee you that the compiler is going to generate code that some verifier is going to be able to verify those bounds. But at least, at least you can say, okay, well, if the compiler knowing everything it knows, it's able to know, to, to, to infer those bounds statically at compile time, then there is some chance that a verifier is going to be able to do the same thing afterwards. Thanks. Uh, I'm just curious, would it be possible to add a variable in that? So it's basically if you had a loop that was dependent on another variable and you say, like, say if a variable was like allocate this much, so you want to make sure it stays within that, or like a, if an array, you had a dynamic array that was allocated by some space and then you had a, a loop over it and you just, so um, you just want to make sure the loop doesn't go outside the bounds of the, uh, the array or whatever that you passed, so you knew that some variable was, could you do like, a pair, I, don't if, I don't know if compilers could do this, could you actually have like, you know, bound from zero instead of 64, zero dot dot Y? Well, or something. Yes, and actually it will not change. I mean, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, the thing is if the, comp the compiler does do some tracking, it has, you know, some variable tracking, variable variable tracking, for example, there is a pass that does that. Okay. And, if the compiler could statically use that to determine the bounds. Because that way you at least might be able to, if that's the possibility, you could get rid of like, I don't know if it would be optimizing, but instead of say checking a bound check, maybe you could do some other check that you could say, okay, I don't have to do the bound check. The compiler, if it's not verifiable by the compiler, I don't have to yeah. do that. But. Well, I have not tried to do any of this. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the, we are in brainstorming a stage. Anyway, but the, the point here is that those pragmas, they don't convey anything to the to the verifier or in the object file. Right. The second is the optimize or fail pragmas is like make sure that this optimize this particular optimization actually happens. Otherwise, error out. Some of them already exist already. Uh, and then a... very fast. Uh, one question at the back. Oh. Uh, um, first of all, the overifiable. Yeah. So the fact being verifiable or not, to me, should not preclude choosing a level of optimization. 
So O1, O2, those are level of optimization. They are kind of placeholder. They gather a set of optimization options. I right? agree. Being verifiable should be, I think, one verify one option. So dash F verifiable. So that's my first point. Okay, I agree to that. Yeah, yeah dash F for dash M kind of flag. Okay, maybe not minus O verifiable or yes. minus. Yeah. My my second point is that what you are describing seems to be extremely specific to the eBPF verifier. Right. So, so for instance, let's imagine you have a verifier that allow unbounded loop that, uh, in terms of execution time, and have some other mechanism to kill the whatever is executed if it goes beyond beyond a certain bound. And maybe BPF could evolve to that in the future. But the thing is, if you fix a semantic for verifiability for everyone, then you you cannot kind of you cannot tie it to the to the actual backend uh, you are compiling for. Right, and that's precisely why I am proposing and pushing for the generic pass approach, in the sense that what is verifiable and what is not. Well, some things are inherently verifiable, some things are not. And actually, I don't. I not only have the BPF stuff in, in mind, but like I mentioned in the cauldron as well, there are some companies who actually run static analyzers on object code that they compile from their own programs before they put those binaries, they distribute them. So. If you can make your compiler to generate even a slightly more predictable object code, those static analyzers will work better. So, yes, well, security, but, so, security, but you yeah. could have a use case where, let's say, unbounded loop could be disallowed if it's used to index an array, uh, but uh, it could be allowed if it's just extending the runtime because, I mean, in that specific uh, virtual machine, there are some mitigations for kind of extended runtimes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Time check. We're down to two minutes. You have yeah. any more slides, Jose? Yes. Uh, well, basically the assembler, the assembler support. Okay, there are some couple of pointers which are there to be discarded immediately. But um, I think the assembler could do something because it's not about the assembler detecting an assembly time. Everything that the verifier is gonna reject, but even little things will help. Like for example, for the assembler now that it has the CFI stuff. In it, for the assembler, it's trivial to determine when a jump goes backwards, right? So that's something that is simple cases and particular things that BPF programmers will actually appreciate to have at compile time, basically, or in this case, assembly time. So basically, okay, the, this, the conclusion is the solution is going to be a combination of all those things and even additional ideas. So it's not like, okay, only this approach one, two, three, or four. Likely, it's going to be a combination of, of all of it. And what we think is that whatever it is, is going to be developed in both Clang and GCC and maybe other optimizing compilers that will start supporting um, uh, generating BPF code. And uh, well, for that, we need coordination between toolchains, which has been has improved a lot in the last uh, month. Uh, since the LSF meeting, and well, you have some links there. Yong Hong told me that uh, the LLVM um, uh, stuff is no longer in this uh, in these reviews, LLVM.org, but in GitHub, right? Um, so yeah, we don't have time for more. So thank you. Cool. Let's thank our speakers. Thank you.